Hi, my name is Rotendo Nyamuda and welcome to another exciting, phenomenal episode of In My Twenties. In My Twenties. Coming up on today's show, we are interviewing Sia Jasmatic Charles. She is a composer, a musician, and she's not just a trombonist, but she is a bass trombonist as well. The music you're listening to right now is one of her many compositions. So sit back, relax, enjoy today's discussion, comment below, share this episode with your friends and family, and just enjoy. But without any doubt, like I am super, excited for this episode for so many reasons is in the history of in my 20s whatever we're you know just over 50 episodes or so um we have never spoken to a music composer and so and and it's so weird because like music is one of my massive passions i'm always listening to film schools and yes. classical music but it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense i'm like but that should have maybe been like you know at least the first three episodes so i'm super super excited to nah, have it's okay. next <laughs> uh so yes let's get straight into it so first question is Ooh. i would love to hear a little bit about you sia jasmatic Charles in the house. Um, tell us a little bit about your career history, life history, and how you got to where you are today. Cool. Uh, so my name is Sia, Sia Charles. Um, Jazzmatic is a pseudonym that I use, you know, on social media. Um, I'm a trombone player. I'm also a composer and a budding arranger. I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. And yeah, I'm a jazz musician. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah, so, yeah, tell me, like, no one wakes up and says, I'm going to be a jazz musician. Because I know you, like, from, from yeah. back in the day, we both took music as a subject, yeah. right? We both had yes, our parents yes, yes. going, mm -hmm. you know, this is cute. Like, you know, after high school, this is this, you know, it's not going to be the hobby that becomes your full-time yeah. job. But you are a yeah. <laughs> musician. You're a full-time jazz musician. So tell me about, like, that upbringing, the journey. How hmm. did your passion slash hobby in high school and subject become your career? Oh man, um, I was very grateful to have um, a mom who was very supportive of the arts. She loved the arts, from, you know, theater, acting for camera, music, jazz, she loved it all. So my sister and I were very artsy people, like throughout, you know, our, our lives we did, um, theater arts as little children, and that helped us to build our confidence. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mama used to listen to the most beautiful music, um, like uh, the Philadelphia soul music, the OJs, you know, mm -hmm. um, Detroit Spinners, you know, so we always had such a beautiful sound growing up with, and that really made me fall in love with music as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was very encouraging. As much as we were, well, I know I was quite academic growing up, but I also loved music very much um so she really encouraged us to follow our passions really mm. yeah even though i do have some family members who when i told them at the end of my matric year i was going to study jazz they laughed at me but uh <laughs> <laughs> who's laughing Mama now like, ah. <laughs> 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 oh, so i'm grateful i didn't listen to that i'm grateful i didn't allow it to discourage me um but i have to give Thanks to my mom, you know, she was just so supportive and um, she went to every recital, every performance, you know, she was very encouraging. So, yeah, I think it was just something that um, I really felt called to do. Wow. Yeah, so, I wow. Just to take that route. <laughs> so at what point did you decide uh, that this was this was it? Was it a was it a moment? Because you're talking about like, you know, a calling and a purpose. And I feel like a majority of our 20s yeah. is spent trying to find this purpose, this calling that you speak of. Was there a specific moment or a point where you're like, yeah, actually, sure. or a feeling or a song you heard where you're like, this is it. Like, this is, this is mm -hmm. it my life. Did you have that moment? Wow. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think um, at the end of my grade seven year, I had to make a decision where I wanted to, you know, go to high school. So my mom had plans for me to move to Cape Town because we were in Port Elizabeth at the time. Mm -hmm. We spent a lot of our childhood there. 
So um, she had a plan for um, us to move to Cape Town. And um, I almost went to Cape Town, but then I listened to my school band playing at the high school, at Pearson High School. Yeah. And they had this phenomenal um, conductor. His name is Graham Bayer, multi-instrumentalist, absolute maestro. <laughs> so I heard him conducting the band. I heard the school, the, the, the wind orchestra. I heard them and I was like, wow, I have to play there. Even if it's a triangle, I don't know what I have to do, but I have to go there. <laughs> so that kind of steered um, the journey, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely steered the journey. And I think when I got to grade 10 and um, I'd been going to the uh, National Youth Jazz Festival as a kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized going to those festivals, attending the workshops, watching the performances and getting a chance to perform made me realize, wow, this is really something that makes me so happy. Mm -hmm. So when I got to grade 10, I realized that this, not, not only do I really love this, but there are doors that are opening, which are enabling me to do more of what I love to do. So that's when I realized, end of my grade 10 year, okay, I'm doing music. This is it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how different was, uh, how different was, you know, playing music or taking music as an instrument, going to the jazz festivals, being, you know, part of these various orchestras, and then actually studying it? Because that's a game changer. I mean, I know from back in the day, like theory, like yeah. practical was fun. Like I was always there with the practical. I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> People are like, what oh, instruments? Yeah. Goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, yeah. <laughs> how do you play the flute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your favorite flute song? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm kidding. Um, so, but the theory. Oh, I'm, the flute I'm, is amazing. The flute is amazing. I, I miss it, Tamara. I do miss it. Um, but I do want to like understand like mm. how different or how rigorous is taking music as a as a as a degree mm -hmm. that you're that you're studying for because I think oftentimes people will look at mm -hmm. you know, musicians or dancers or something in the creative field and people are quick to say well that's yeah. so leisurely like you must have fun doing that like how is that a degree but. Uh, explain what fundamentally goes into making music as your degree uh, that you're studying towards and eventually passing. Yeah. And by the way, don't you feel like your master's? Mm -hmm. You have your master's. Well, I had, I was working towards a master, towards but then it. I had to, yeah, take a break from my study. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But <laughs> you will soon, don't worry. I speak it into existence. We'll complete that master's. <laughs> But tell me about the studying, <laughs> the degree part of, of mm -hmm. you know, your music experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the lecturers definitely make you aware of the fact that this is no longer like a, a hobby or a pastime. They make you aware of that the, the moment you register that they are expecting a lot out of you. And um, they also let us know that this is basically a process of elimination that, um, the people who enter with us into first year won't necessarily carry on with us till the end of the degree. And we learned that very soon, very quickly into studying. It's a lot of time, a lot of practicing. Um, I spent many hours um, on A level, which is the practice, uh, practice level of the College of Music, spending many hours grafting, you know, shedding, um, because I realized that I really want to be able to express myself the best way I possibly can. And in order to do that, I need to know my instrument. I need to spend time getting to know it. Mm -hmm. I need to practice. It's basically like, you know, you're an athlete. So you're practicing your endurance, your stamina, also your ear and your hand-eye coordination so that your mind is working the same time that your lips are working and you moving the slides. So that takes a long, long, long time. I also realized that being a trombone player, uh, people don't really expect you to play like amazingly as long as you can kind of like hold a note <laughs> they're like that's fine <laughs> i did not want to be that one i didn't want to be that guy you know <laughs> and my teacher was also very um william halbert he was uh my trombone teacher throughout my university career he was quite a strict guy and he expected the best so that challenged me also it was a good challenge to um become the best version of myself, you know. Mm -hmm. And besides the practical aspect, there's also the academic, mm -hmm. you know, aspect of studying, which means that you really do have to take your time to 
assist and read and understand because if you don't understand from if you, if from the first year you mm -hmm. don't understand your degree and your, and your courses it's going to make it even more difficult because no one really waits for you to get things and you you're also able to um understand music a lot better and also write a lot better compose arrange a lot better if you understand um the theory behind it well for those who are more academic like me i mean i was in nerd heaven because i love to study and yeah. love research so i really enjoyed um yeah studying at ucp wow. it was great wow and speaking of studying i have to answer this i have to answer i have to ask this question uh, a couple of months ago um well, this year still, but I'm sure it's come up before, that Beethoven was actually black. Is that true? Yeah. He was black? Yes, yes, yes. I definitely, I, I think he was black. I really do. And I believe that they whitewashed him. Um, there is an article that I did read where there were so many parallels, like with the way that he composed, right? Oh, are we okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's freezing a little bit. Oh, so is sorry. It? Oh, no, it's okay. I can see you perfectly. Oh, um, Oh, great. Cool, cool. Yeah, there are so many parallels with like um, a lot of African uh, sequences and influences you find in the way that he writes. So mm -hmm. I actually do believe that Beethoven was black. I do. You heard it right here. You heard it right here. Yeah. He was black. That's, it is what it is. From a composer herself. It is, it, is. It, is. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> Speaking of Beethoven, do you have a favorite um, classical musician? that when you Ooh. hear their music you just because i i'm not gonna lie i cry when i listen to like yeah. classical pieces or like film scores uh, it's emotional yeah, yeah, it like, you know they're just like it wills yeah. up and your soul yes. like, what is happening oh for sure yes <laughs> oh wow um who can i think funnily enough when it comes to you know um classical music i do tend to like more of the dark sounding you know, um, like Rachmaninoff, he's got beautiful, rich harmony, but he ha he has sometimes some, uh, like a dark color to his music. Mm -hmm. So I love Rachmaninoff. Um, Kokotius is very, very dark, <laughs> very sinister sounding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for the brass, it's very big and powerful. So I like um, Kokotius as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think off the top of my head, those are the two that I can say. Woohoo! Okay, Always okay. happy to see them, yeah. <laughs> love it, love it. And your favorite uh, period when it comes to classical music? Ooh, I do like, I think it's the romantic, oh yes, the romantic era. Yeah, the beautiful lush harmonies, you mm. know, I, I think of, for example, um, one of the jazz greats, um, his name is Charlie Parker, saxophone. Mm. He was influenced by, I can't remember what the, who the composer was, was it Schumann or, it was a romantic composer. Wow. He was very, very inspired by him. Um, I can't get the name, but yeah, if I do, I'll let you know. Absolutely. So, and I think you hear a lot of jazz harmony within the romantic period. Mm. Very big, lush harmony, you know, very rich. Um, so I'll taste the romantic period, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're speaking of, you know, things like harmony and melody and, and, and fundamentally, like, as, uh, okay, so I did study a little bit of music, so I mean, I'm not going to say, like, I'm the average person, but the average person will oh. just throw around, <laughs> will just throw around <laughs> terms. But there is so much to composing pieces. Can you take me through, because um, I, I mean, like, you are an incredible, incredible composer. And um, I think it was what, it was uh, your piece that you composed, was it for your grandfather who passed away? Yes, yes, yes. Ah, <laughs> yo, yo, yo. It's just, oh. there is... Music is a conversation, essentially. Music okay, is this like, beautiful conversation that you're having. I can only imagine as a musician between you, your instrument, and you know, the page, but then when the audience engages, now you're talking, it's kind of like having a conversation and you're just letting people into the room um, and then they can kind of take it and interpret it and put it in their lives as they you know, please. But, what does it take to compose? What is your composition process? Mm -hmm. Wow, wow, that is very true, yeah. Um, my, my process of composing is, funnily enough, I do things the other way around. 
I'm more of a like a harmonic thinker than a melodic thinker. Mm -hmm. um, so what what helps me is just playing around on the piano. If I hear maybe a chord progression that I really like, um, I will play around with that chord progression and see if I can somehow weave a melody um, with reference to the harmony. And um, usually I, I like to use simple harmony, simple melodies over complex harmonies mm -hmm. because the melody is what people will, will remember. It, you can always sing it, you know, wherever, but mm -hmm. the harmony really creates the color underneath, you know, the texture and everything. Mm -hmm. So I, I do like to spend time on the piano. I think of the harmony first, the chord progressions, mm -hmm. and then from that I get a melody. Mm -hmm. which is like weaving over everything that's happening like you know uh -huh. at the bottom yeah <laughs> and, so, and so coming back to the piece that you wrote about your grandfather because that was obviously a very personal piece it wasn't mm -hmm. necessarily i walked down the street and you know yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh there there is a lot of you know obviously memory and and heartfeltness behind that so how was what was your approach to mm -hmm. that Okay, so um, the title of the piece is uh, it's called Kualanga, uh, the township that we grew up in as kids. And um, that's where I met my grandpa for the first time, because we were living in the Eastern Cape before we, you know, mama moved us to Cape Town to spend time with the grandparents, which is kind of like a traditional thing that happens in, you know, in, in the black culture, they, uh, where your parents say, you know what, you guys are too spoiled, you need to spend time with your grandparents <laughs> and eat healthy food. <laughs> So um, I spent time uh, with my grandparents. Um, I got to know my paternal granddad, um, Patrick Mkumbuzi, and no, maternal, sorry, maternal granddad. And um, he was, I think, probably the closest male figure in my life. Mm. So when he passed away, um, I was about six years old, and I was so sad because we were very close. And um, I only realized 10 years after he passed, my mom mentioned to me that he loved jazz and uh, he played trumpet and saxophone. And that inspired me to write a song for him. The song is it's, um, it's based over the Marabi harmony, which is known in township jazz, you know, um, as Brahim Hugh Matugela writes a lot of music and the African jazz pioneers. They also write music based on the one, four, five, you know, mm -hmm. chord progression. So, um, and I heard the harmonies, funnily enough, in the shower mm -hmm. after I got the, I heard the melody and the harmonies of the, of the horns in the shower after wow. I had the, the chord, you know, the chord progression down. So I started singing the melody and busy washing. <laughs> and then um, <laughs> I take time to sit down and score the, you know, the, do they call it to score the three horns the three mm. parts to the horn mm. and um mm. that's how i got the song yeah and it's dedicated to him he loved music he loved jazz and yeah the whole jazz thing never really made a lot of sense until mm. my mom told me oh your grandpa loved jazz <laughs> he would sit and sneak a bottle you know sneak a glass of uh, whiskey and just sit and listen to jazz you know wow. <laughs> and that's the vision i had when i wrote the song wow. i had a vision old man with a you know glass of whiskey just enjoying some jazz you know <laughs> yo, yo, yo. and 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 as a musician as a creative excuse me <coughs> oh go ahead no okay. worries go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> as a musician and as a creative do you feel that when you have that melody or you have the harmony or you have a piece a composition that's come to you it kind of doesn't leave you until you write it down Oh, for sure, definitely. It's an earworm that won't go away. <laughs> I've got to write it down. I found with a lot of the songs, you know, that I've been hearing, like chords, like there's a song I've been wanting to, to write for my mom. Um, I kept hearing these chords all the time mm -hmm. and they wouldn't leave me. And then mm -hmm. I just took a piece of paper and wrote them down and then it was gone. But then I had documented it so then I don't forget. Because sometimes <laughs> you hear something beautiful, but then if you don't document it, then you forget it, which is yeah. very annoying. But yeah. yeah. It does help just to write it down and <laughs> put it on paper. <laughs> put it on paper. And do you, do you like, um, I know this might sound like random, but I know for me, like when I've got an idea or concept, yeah. I'll take a pen yeah. and then I'll literally like write down the notes. Do you take a uh -huh. pen and paper and like uh -huh. just like, like write down staves and then like notes and be like, do you do that? 
for sure. Yes, I do. I do. Yeah, I used to carry, well, in my younger years of nerd, you know, nerddom, I used to carry manuscript paper with me everywhere I went. So if I heard something, I would just kind of write it down. Yeah, I'm not as disciplined, but I do have a notebook that I do carry with me. And uh, if I don't write the actual melody, I'll just write the harmony, like the chord progressions, and then that'll help me to come up with yeah, melody, yeah. yeah. Because it's a, it's a language ultimately. So when you write down sure. like A, A flat, B, C, whatever it for is, sure. you're, you're, yes. you're conversing, you understand what's happening on the page. Yes. Someone else would be like, oh, that's sure. notes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you got uh, it, oh, money. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. And so when, you're, when you get to like, you know, you're obviously when you're in the zone of writing, like it's super exciting, you're there, you're probably not sleeping, you forget to eat, whatever it is when, I know like as creatives when you're in the zone, but what, yes, happens, yes, yes. <laughs> what happens when you reach a writer's block? How do you come oh, out of that writer's block? I had that for a very long time, um, especially, um, I, I referenced my mom a lot because, you know, as you know, she unfortunately passed away and she's mm -hmm. one of my biggest inspirations. Um, I sometimes when you're stressed out emotionally, mentally, when you've got a lot of things that are stressing you out, um, sudden life changes, they do cause a bit of a, a, a block in the, I call it the flow, you know, just the natural flow of being inspired by things around you. Um, so uh, I have uh, experienced writer's block and it's one of the most frustrating things of your life because you want to create, you want to write, you know, you want to express yourself in that way, but you either run out of ideas mm -hmm. or you think of an idea, but you're like, oh, that sounds too basic. That's too simple. But mm -hmm. I've realized, you know, as I grow older that it's not about how, you know, complicated or simple the music is as long as it speaks to people, you know, mm -hmm. and people hear the intention in the music and that's what pulls them to listen and to be inspired and encouraged. So, um, yeah, a lot of things can affect you know, issues, yeah. you know, this life can cause that the block of the natural flow, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. sure. being inspired. Oh, sure, sure. I'm, I'm incredibly, I'm not even going to lie, incredibly inspired by you, by what you've done with your career. Because I think mm -hmm. at some point, uh, <laughs> at some point, funnily enough, one thing that I haven't, that I don't really tell people or that not people that I haven't told them is like people don't know about me, but I did get a music scholarship to study um, music. And I mean, yeah, that, that's oh where God. I was. Like, that's where I was. Like, high school matric, you know, band leader, staying at all of the orchestras, yes. Yes, whatever, sure. like Stanford's, and you yes, name it. Yeah. And you just get into it. And for the longest time, I mean, it wasn't, mm. a, it wasn't necessarily an yes. option, option, but it's some every now and again, mm. like when I'm listening to like a like Hans Zimmer doing his thing. <laughs> Uh, I'm like, what, what if, you know, yes. oh, what, what would have happened had I, had I chosen mm. it and, and yeah, mm. but I, but I'm so happy that I'm still connected to it oh. and that I can still, you know, appreciate music. So oh, for seeing, sure, you, yes. seeing you mm. is an inspiration to, to kind of, oh, it is the answer to the question, you know, the what if, you know, so thank you for oh, hiring, man. thank you for doing you, yeah. <laughs> Really means thank you and thank you for being so amazing and for um, having such a passion for the arts you can see that it's still such a, a beautiful big part of you you know still so close to your heart and the beautiful thing is you know we're all so very young who knows like maybe sooner rather than later you could find yourself kind of back there you know what I mean in an amazing <laughs> way for sure yeah just uh, just rock up to like some orchestra and be like I'm back I'll be like, who are exactly. you? Exactly. <laughs> I'm here, I'm back. I'm here, just get I'm back, I'm here. First food, move out the way, I'm here. <laughs> um, but two things I, 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 I want to discuss, and the first part of the next section I want to discuss is, first of all, you have performed and played alongside some of the most incredible jazz musicians in the world, uh, including the late Huma Sakela, Simpiwe Dana, uh, Jimmy Dludlu, freshly ground to name a few. And you're so humble about it because, I mean, I just see you walking in the street. Like, you should be like, guys, do you want me to sign something? But, <laughs> yeah. 
tell me how have you managed to how has it been or how was it playing with you know those caliber of musicians and how have you managed to make a consistent incredibly successful career out of being a jazz musician oh man um, well thank you so much um, for that um working with these amazing um musicians you know you are in their space and you just realize how humble they are you know and they really love the music if there's no airs about them there's no ego they really are just passionate about their music um and it really like engulfs them and envelops them. I, I remember hearing um, assistant Tiwa Dana, she was uh, practicing, getting ready for her um, concert at the jazz festival. And she felt as though her, her, her vocal cords were somehow like clogged, like blocked. So she was belting and um, it, it really felt like a, like a release that she was doing also just because uh, it's a very spiritual thing, you know, when you sing or when you play your instrument, it all flows into one, you know, pretty much one vessel. Um, so she was just practicing and belting and really releasing her soul, I think, in order to release her voice. So that was amazing how dedicated they are to their craft. And um, they're always thinking, always creating, always um, aiming for the next thing. It's never a thing of like celebrating, you know, the glory of maybe that one album that was like the thriller for them, you know. They're always moving towards the next. And that was really inspiring and um, also challenging in a good way to encouraged me to create some more, you know? Yeah, it was a wonderful experience. Wow, wow. And what have some of your personal career highlights been um, along your, your professional career? Okay, um, I hate competitions, first and foremost. <laughs> I'm not a competitive person. I hate self-promotion. Um, but uh, there was an opportunity that, you know, made its way, that opened um, its way for me. It was called the Emirates Pursuit of Jazz. So it's kind of like a like an online reality show, which is kind of like Jazz Idol, you know, um, hosted by Kaya FN, as well as Emirates, the airline, and um, Satch Music, uh, James Bassingthwaite, who's the head of Satch Music, he was the musical director. So they combined and collaborated to form Emirates Pursuit of Jazz and it was basically like um, uh, auditions from about 500 different applicants, you know, around the country. And from that, they selected top 10. From, that, from there, they select top five. And once you're in the top five, you get to, you know, encourage people to vote, 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 vote for me, you know, which I really didn't like, but okay. Um, it, was, it was great. It was wonderful. So we ended up in the top five. And then we had, you know, performances, which was like the finals. And from that, you know, final, we, uh, we had a joint winning between myself and an incredible bassist. His name is Galim um, Ngobeni. He's mm -hmm. from Joburg, originally from Guiani. So that was wonderful. We got to um, travel to New York City to play our music at the Blue Note Jazz Club. Wow. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> <laughs> and just for people I mean, who don't know, like tell us like how like iconic that jazz club is. Okay, yes, yes. Um, wow, the jazz. I mean, one of the greatest musicians. You see them plastered there. You, you see the um, the let me think. BB King. You saw BB King performed there, and um, to Korea. Just the greats, you know, the jazz greats. Um, also, we have uh, a new era of jazz musicians who are performing there like Christian Scott, you know. So a lot of them have done their apprenticeship at the Blue Note. So it's kind of like a rite of passage for a lot of jazz musicians. And it was such an honor. It was very humbling to be there and to not be a sideman because I do a lot of work as a sideman, you know. I play for a lot of bands, but to, um, to play my music, my compositions, it was really such an encouraging experience and very motivating because we have instances as musicians where you find yourself you know playing in a dingy you know jazz club weed smoke all over the place and you get paid 200 bucks at the end of the gig and you kind of ask yourself is this worth it mm. so when you experience something where it's like hey it is worth it it's so encouraging and it inspires you to keep on you know just to wow. keep on creating and yeah, it was really a wonderful experience. Sure, sure. <laughs> and I must point out in a number of pictures that you've uploaded and put up, you are usually, if not the only female, 
you're one of two. Uh, okay. Tell me about the, <laughs> those dynamics um, within the jazz industry. Is it still very much, I mean, it looks like it's still very much male dominated. And how do you, how have you managed to find your, uh, your, your voice and your, your music mm. abilities and to stand out as mm. arguably one of the most incredible trombone players in the country, on the continent, in this male dominated space? Um, <laughs> I'm just saying that um, people need to Google them and look it up. You'll find Google trombone players, most incredible. Sia Charles comes up. Google me, baby. Only Sia comes up. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Uh, yes, it is still quite male dominated, you know, um, Rue and. Um, there are times where, for example, you are holding a rehearsal and, you know, you are the band leader. And sometimes as much as, you know, cats do try to be progressive, there's still that thing of like, do you know what you're talking about? It's like, <laughs> they kind of assume that women don't really know what they're talking about. And even when you do express, like you give creative direction, they will maybe ask another member of the band, like, should I do this? I had an instance where, where I, um, experience that where I was giving where one of the um, musicians was asking about the chart that I had written for one of my you know compositions and he was asking another member of the band for creative direction and I said to him hey I can help you I can cue you if you want and he was like yeah I'll just ask this other guy you know so things like that you know like uh, where they kind of like subliminally like undermine your um, your vision in a way like maybe you don't really know how to give direction yeah. that can be a bit discouraging but um, it doesn't always happen um, mm. a lot of guys um, that I've had to work that I've worked with um, are very encouraging and they see you as a musician mm. first and then oh wow she, okay she happens to be a girl but she's a musician mm. and they also don't cut me slack over like oh let's just make it a bit easier for the girl I don't like that you know <laughs> so um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I don't do that. Um, <laughs> but that's, uh, that's encouraging. Um, yeah. you know, and it, it, it's helped uh, for me because growing up, I've always been quite tomboyish. You know, I love hanging out with guys. You know, so it's, it's kind of normal. But you, we also remember, okay, I am a woman. So sometimes people who don't know you, you know, don't know your, um, your personality, your disposition, mm -hmm. they will assume, eh, it's mm. going to be the weak link, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Until um, you pick up an instrument and you play. Then you and then, you know? and you, you just ask them if you're playing. And then they're like, oh, okay, I get it. Okay, don't worry. Give me, give me the cue. Give me the cue. Show me the direction. Okay. <laughs> Wild. Oh, yeah. but also, also, your instrument is quite... Do you just pay, do you pay bass trombone or is it just trombone? Okay, so I, I play tenor trombone, you know, for small, you know, combo settings where it's like maybe one instrument, one trumpet, saxophone, one trombone. Um, but when it comes to like large ensembles, like big bands, and symphony orchestras, I'm very comfortable on bass trombone. Mm. So it's like, I think if I had to choose, I would definitely be a bass trombone. I love it. <laughs> but it's also I'm such a very happy to play. It's a powerful instrument, oh, yeah. though. It's not. It's oh yeah, not yeah. Loud to play. It's not like I know all instruments are like incredible. And all instruments For are sure. Like, yeah. Yes. Like, yes. But bass trombone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's amazing! I love it. <laughs> uh, you're not playing. You're not playing. You're not playing. Ah, uh, you're not playing. <laughs> No, but yo, no, just just definitely incredible. And most recently, you were actually on tour uh, playing. So you know, besides the jazz work you do and the orchestral work you do and the you name it, music place backing up. You know, some of the most incredible musicians to have ever lived on the planet. Uh, you also play in uh, theater productions. You know, within the yeah. Orchestra. And if I'm not mistaken, mm. you were on tour with Matilda when oh, yeah. it as well. So tell oh, me, how goodness. have you been affected mm. uh, as a musician by COVID? Sure. Yes, yes, yes. Um, wow. COVID, I think, hit the, the arts industry first before all the other different industries. You know, we had to cancel so many shows. And I have some uh, colleagues who had 
tours, uh, European tours for maybe like two, three months, and those have to be canceled. And um, so our, lively, our livelihood and our ability to perform was really affected. You know, we weren't able to um, play at live venues. You know, all of the live venues were closed down. A lot of the tours that, I, that we were supposed to do were canceled. And not only for a certain month of months, but like the entire season of the tours of the musical was canceled. So that was a big blow, you know, because as musicians, although a lot of us are freelancers, sometimes it also helps to have a stable job, you know, just to take away the anxiety of like, how am I going to pay my bills this month? You know, things like that. So it does help to have a stable job and um, the Tilda the Musical was that for me. Yeah, it was my stable job. And um, yeah, it was tough. It's been tough. A lot of musicians are really going through it. A lot of musicians, um, their mental health is really um, an, a, a topic that needs to be discussed more in the, in the arts because a lot of musicians, a lot of artists are uh, either contemplating or committing suicide. Wow. You know, there was an amazing um, opera singer. I think he was part of the um, Gauteng opera chorus I'm not quite sure he committed suicide and this is a, a man who's married with two children so um, the government also just doesn't give enough support to artists they call us lazy because they say we don't have our administration together but a lot of um, artists maybe don't have um, internet access and laptops to be able to um, apply for these relief funds and a lot of them don't hear about the relief fund until it's the applications are closed so it's been tough you know it's been really tough for musicians mm. yeah sure and have you guys managed to at least start getting back together to you know whether it's starting mm. to rehearse because you know you're speaking about mental health and I feel like especially yeah. as a creative and as you said creatives were hit first and and possibly mm. the hardest uh, because it is sometimes seen as a you know leisure pastime, which is also really yeah. offensive. Because it's like yeah, it is. you see it as a leisure pastime. Are you not enjoying as the person either paying or going to get? Is the creativity of the creative not in some mm -hmm. way inspiring mm -hmm. your life? Besides right, your nine to five, yeah. you engage with TV shows or you listen mm. to music, you see the art painting, sure. you're reading the book, yeah. you're engaging with mm. artists' work to alleviate whatever stress is going on in your life. For so, sure. how can one person see it as, you know, this like, oh, it's, you know, let the arts people suffer the first, suffer first? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It's a very beautiful point that you bring up, you know, very, very important and beautiful points because. Um, a lot of people are inspired by the music we play. I mean, Cape Town International Jazz Fest, all the BE Fat Cats are there having a, a whale of a time. Um, and uh, we're entertainment for them. But then when it's time for us to receive support and they don't take us seriously. So yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's bad. It's quite bad. <laughs> and you just said it, it's, it, essentially it's just entertainment. And that's, you know, that's cute, which is painful. <laughs> <laughs> but how have have you guys started managing to get together to practice to play to just get back into some cycle of you know work work mm. back in this community space even in the midst of this mm. pandemic yes yes well um there's actually a, i think it's a uh it's called alone together it's like online sessions uh that musicians kind of like create music in their own different space. So you'll have a double bassist playing, drummer playing, and um, maybe guitarist. And they're all just kind of like connecting via online, you know, streaming and they're making music. So even though it is quite remote, we're still able to connect, which is really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And also with the rise of um, online streaming of uh, live uh, performances, it really has been a lifesaver for a lot of musicians, you know, um, a great lifesaver for us because we're still able to play, mm -hmm. uh, of course, while following, you know, the protocols. So if you go to a rehearsal, you will have to sanitize, wear your mask, uh, maintain 1.5 meter distance. So mm -hmm. we, we do incorporate those, you know, those um, COVID-19 protocols, but it, it, it's still just so ah, freeing, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to play because with the level five um lockdown it was we couldn't do anything for like a good two months mm. so things have just started to open up which is great yeah right. and i think 
online is the way to go, you know? It's kind of like an adapt or fly kind of thing. So we have to adapt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so on that note, let's switch gears into your 20s journey. I know you're like a right. movie where we're on mm. the, <laughs> we're, we're slowly etching out of our 20s, but it's okay. We're still in oh. our 20s. We're still coming here. We're still here. Um, so oh, yeah. tell me, how would you summarize your 20s journey thus far? Mm -hmm. Wow, the 20s, man. Lots of ups and lots of downs. Yeah. I learned a lot about life. Um, yeah, I think um, my early 20s were a ball. I did a lot of playing. Um, I had a lot of uh, friendships I created in the music space, you know, and just connecting with different people. These were the, the early 20s. And mid 20s, um, the more you, you know, get out of college, you move away from the college setting to more professional the more professional setting, you learn a lot about life and just how to, you know, relate with different people in certain ways. So um, my 20s were a lot of fun, the early 20s. Yeah, mm -hmm. I had a lot of fun. I did a lot of playing, got to travel a bit and meet a lot of friends. So, yeah, yeah. Wow. Early 20s were good. <laughs> <laughs> and how are you feeling about uh, etching closer towards the, the big three zero? Wow. It's like next month. <laughs> Can I be honest? I still feel like a kid. Can I be honest with you? I feel like a child still. I feel so young. I feel like I'm 21 years old, you know. Um, I just, I don't know. I know the 30s are supposed to be this big thing. But I think, I guess, you know, as artists, we, you know, we mature differently. You know what I mean? Like, we have our own time capsule thing that we go through. Yeah, you know what I mean? So... I'm aware of it, but I'm not aware of it. Mm -hmm. I still feel very, very young. I still yeah. feel like there's so much that I want to do, so much I want to see, so many people I want to reach out and meet, and you know. So it's, I guess, it's just a part of life. But uh, yeah, it's, yeah, that's how I see it. You know? <laughs> how do you find it? I mean, how do you find what? being in that space, like where thirty is like around the corner? How what? do you experience that? I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Like you, what you said about the huh? we don't age and we don't believe in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. In, in all honesty, I, I, it's been very interesting because I think now, I think like 28, 27, like there was a bit of a panic to like, what is this, you know, building up to. But, but I think that sure. just working and doing things that I love and that I'm passionate about and being in a space mm. where, you know, family is good and happy and healthy. And if anything, this pandemic has taught me that you know just appreciate life as it is and the people in your life true. that i'm true. actually i feel like it's just the next number you know yeah for sure right right yeah oh, we're good we're good we're gonna be all right and so tell me have you ever experienced <laughs> a quarter life crisis or you know some sort of crisis within your 20s and how did you overcome it Oh, sorry, I didn't quite get that. Um, okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Sorry, I'm going to repeat it. Uh, okay. Uh, Kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so coming to the quarter life crisis section of part is, yeah. have you ever experienced the quarter life crisis or some crisis <laughs> in your 20s? What was the crisis and how did you get over it? Wow. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I think I was 24 years old. Um, and I realized, I, I've always had this um, formula in life. Input equals output, right? So you put in your hard work, your effort, and the output is you, you know, receive what you've been working for, what you desire. So I, um, there was an opportunity for me to go to, I think it was Georgia State University. So I had, you know, um, acquired like some, some sponsorships and things like that. I was ready, I was excited. Um, but I found that uh, there were quite a few humps, you know, in the road. And as a result of that, I actually had to um, forfeit a couple of scholarships and I had to um, defer my, um, what do they call it? I had to defer my, I wasn't able to register in time. So that was like phew, 
a, a time in my life where it felt like everything was crumbling down because uh, I guess I, I was quite spoiled. I was very used to my input equals output formula. Yeah. So when it doesn't always work out, it's like devastating. So that was tough for me. Um, also because um, a lot of people who I cared about, people who knew me, you know, like in music circles, knew about the fact that I was supposed to go to Georgia State. And um, that not working out was very like um, humiliating, embarrassing. But my mom, she really encouraged me to not give up, to keep on trying. And um, other doors opened, you know, which were encouraging for my self-esteem, you know, for my ego, you know, things like that. So that was like whew, a lesson that things don't always work out, but um, you just have to just continue to have faith and um, things will work out the way that they're supposed to. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Perseverance on another level. And I think that that, that happens Time and time again, I think yeah. throughout life, but particularly in your 20s, mm. you have this mm. idea and dream of yeah. like, this is what my life is going to be like. And like what you've said, yeah. input equals output. So I mean, for you in this instance, it's like I've worked hard. I've dedicated my life to music. I've been accepted. I've got the scholarships. You, you mm -hmm. fix everything mm -hmm. off the box and still the yeah. outcome wasn't the desired outcome. For sure. Yeah, you know, yeah, definitely, definitely. That's mm -hmm. tough. And heartbreak, you know, heartbreak sucks. That yeah. also sucks, you know. <laughs> Stayed away from boys after that, yeah. <laughs> My first major heartbreak, I was 25 years old. Um, yeah, that sucks. <laughs> um, but it, it encouraged me also just to be discerning, you know. Um, we're not all the same and we don't all want the same things. And also, most importantly, um, we all deserve um, reciprocated love. We all yeah. deserve love, to be loved wholeheartedly and unconditionally. And I think when you're young, you, sometimes you just don't understand what that is. So you may not know how to receive it or how to give it, you know. So that was an experience that, that I went through. But it definitely um, helped to open my eyes to be a lot more discerning. Mm -hmm. And um, it also encouraged me to work on things that do work out like you know career things like that academics so yeah it was a good learning lesson yeah wow <laughs> wow and and with all the all the life before I, before we get to our last you know question which is advice and stuff for people in their 20s but i'm truly truly excited to see like where your career takes you next and what you're going to do and you know be it composing for feature films and tv shows and playing on more global jazz stages like whatever you you're 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 going towards i think it's i definitely know it's going to be massive please just don't forget me i will be in the crowd i'll be like Jasmatic, Jasmatic. What? No <laughs> And you'll be like, and you'll be like, no flash, but no, oh, no, 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 no. Someone no. take her out. <laughs> that one. <laughs> but I, but I'm true. Please don't look at me. <laughs> don't look at me with your eyes. <laughs> but I'm, but I'm. It's, it's emotional on so many levels. I mean, because like I said, like music is such a passion of mine. And so seeing you grow through it yes, yes, and, yes, yes. and and I know even beyond this conversation, even just on our friendship level, like I know there is a lot mm. you've been through and to see you um, like now and even before now, I've always just been like, oh, she's, she's doing it. It is inspiring. I feel the same way about you. I, I was, <laughs> I've been very, very inspired by your journey and most importantly, how true you are to yourself how dedicated you are to your work, to your craft, and just also the way that you're, you, you are a visionary, you know, and you have this entrepreneurial spirit about you that is just so admirable. And that's the true essence of being, you know, in the arts. We are entrepreneurs and you really um, encapsulate that so well. And you um, work, I mean, work with some of the greatest, uh, like, like, uh, Forbes Africa, you know, I think you were um, a, a writer on Forbes Africa, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. Wow, how my <laughs> Amazing. Wow. Well, and on that note, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, you know, when you have like me, I know, I know, I'm just like, um, so final <laughs> No, really, I, I, I okay, really, <laughs> I do appreciate it, and I thank you, and I appreciate it's it. Very so inspiring. Much.
I do appreciate your words. It's the one thing, that, the biggest thing I've possibly learned in my 20s is to accept. Yeah. And it's been one of the difficult mm-hmm. just accept when people do give you compliments and stuff. Most, I, mm-hmm. back in the day, it was like, a, no, you're lying. And you run away from it. <laughs> Embracing that is, oh, is such wow. a beautiful yeah. thing. So, thank you so much. Um, oh, wow, wow, wow. So my final question is you have, oh my goodness, thank you so much for sharing your journey, your career, your, you know, kind of life. Um, I, the only thing missing is, you know, your trombone. <laughs> <laughs> Go get it. <laughs> but what advice would you want to leave with people who are in their 20s? Um, mm. and, and, and for this one, particularly people in their twenties who are in the arts, who may mm. be going through, you know, we, you spoke about that section of, you know, input mm. and you're not really seeing the output, but you know, yeah. in yeah, your, yeah, yeah. every fiber of your being that this is what mm. you were called to do, but they've, hit, sure. that rock, they've hit that disappointment. What advice mm. encouragement mm. do you have for them? Oh man, I, I would definitely say keep going at it, you know, um, be almost stubborn, you know, about your dreams and uh, your goals and aspirations. There will always be somebody out there who will be moved by you walking in your purpose. You know, there will always be people who are encouraged by that. There will always be support. Um, It's never in vain. And also most importantly, you know, do it from your heart. Do it because you love it. You know, when your intention is really to create a change um things do really work out for sure they definitely work out and um yeah never give up you know be stubborn about your goals yeah accept defeat uh, resilience is very important uh and uh, be a good person yeah be be a person that people want to work with that's very important um yeah because for example there are um you know, artists that I've worked with, with fellow colleagues where they are brilliant musicians, but they are not very nice to work with. Mm-hmm. So then they miss out on a lot of opportunities because as an artist, you know, a lot of what we do is word of mouth, you know, a lot of connections, industry connections are formed through word of mouth. So it's also very important to be, um, to have good people skills, to know how to work with people. Yeah, that's very important as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Such vital, vital insights and input. Thank you so much.